you. Thank you, Matt and David, for including me and for all of your hard work organizing this, and thanks to the other organizers. So um, we've been hearing a lot in the past day about um, the complexities of relating different levels of organizations, the complexities of networks of proteins within cells, and I just want to pile on and tell you about another layer of complexity, and that is really um, the complexity of cell types. And, and I want to try to convince you that neuronal cell types um, really represent a sort of critical bottleneck in the biology of trying to understand how it is that the genome can actually produce circuits that ultimately uh, produce behavior and that go awry in disease. And um, so I'm not, this is by no means a solved problem, um, but I just want to share with you some of the approaches that we've been taking um, to, to try to tackle this problem. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a problem that's at different uh, stages, as it were, in different kinds of preparation. So um, if you work like Astrid does, or like my colleague Eve Martyr does, on the stomatogastric uh, ganglion of decapod crustacea, uh, it's largely a solved problem what the component cell types are. And in systems like this, or in the nervous system of C. elegans, investigators in laboratories across the world can go and record from the same uh, cell type or watch the same cell type uh, and really know, uh, really work out what the details of the circuit are. Um, but in my favorite uh, organ in preparation, the uh, neocortex of mammals, uh, that's much less of a solved problem. And it turns out that in many uh, regions of the mammalian brain, we, there really isn't a, 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 a consensus as to uh, what the flavors of, of, of neurons are. So in the neocortex, broadly, there are, there are two main classes that everyone agrees on. There are uh, pyramidal neurons, which make uh, long-range connections. They're the uh, output neurons of the cortex. They're excitatory. They use the neurotransmitter glutamate. Uh, and there are a diverse set of GABAergic interneurons that are inhibitory and um, uh, that are the subject of, of much of the efforts to, to classify. And how these neurons get classified really depends on what you like to do for a living. So if you like to look at morphology, whether it be it somatodendritic or axonal, you might classify cells one way. If you like to uh, record their intrinsic or synaptic properties, uh, you might uh, classify them another way, but ultimately all of these cellular phenotypes presumably arise from the genes that these uh, cells express. And so the uh, approach that we've been taking recently is to use uh, microarrays, which you've heard a description of what they are, and I can explain further if there are questions, uh, or more recently uh, second generation sequencing um, to uh, look at all of the genes that are expressed in particular cell types. And so much of what I'm going to tell you about really is um, aimed at this. So th this works because the techniques for uh, amplifying small amounts of nucleic acids are uh, excellent. So compared to the difficulty of, for example, isolating and the lack of an ability to amplify the proteins that these cells express, their nucleic acids, because they're of complementarity can, can readily be amplified. So from only, uh, you know, 50 cells or so, we can amplify enough material to uh, probe a microarray or to um, uh, do uh, next generation sequencing. And just to reiterate, for those of you that aren't familiar with this technology, what a microarray is, it's essentially a place code for genes. So each little spot on this glass chip represents a complementary sequence to one gene in, in, a, in the mouse genome, and then an intensity code, how much fluorescent nucleic acid is bound, uh, is a readout of how much of that gene is being expressed. And so you can just put this through a scanner and then uh, you use a bunch of methods to, to figure out the overall expression. So um, when we uh, started this work a number of years ago, there were not nearly as many choices as there are now for um, lines of mice in which to uh, identify, based on fluorescent protein expression, specific uh, subtypes of, of neurons. And uh, so here's one, uh, this is line YFPH, probably the most widely studied 
mouse line in all of neuroscience at this point. It was made by Gaoping Feng in Josh Zanes' lab um, a, a number of years ago, and it, it expresses a yellow fluorescent protein under the Thi1 promoter. Thi1, it turns out, is an antigen that's expressed by uh, almost all um, neurons and many immune cells, but because of positional effects, the expression is restricted, and in the cortex, it's restricted to neurons that we knew and uh, loved. Uh, these are some uh, recordings made by Jesper Jolström uh, a long time ago, and, and uh, these are, are actually recordings in uh, uh, mouse. These are neurons from the rat, but what we can see is that they have a very characteristic uh, intrinsic electrophysiology. They're non-adapting in response to sustained uh, current injection, whereas if one re records from unlabeled cells nearby within the slice, they have a variety of different firing patterns. They might show repetitive bursting uh, or uh, adaptation, the property of um, uh, action potentials being more spaced uh, in, despite uh, constant current. Um, and so based both on their morphology, on their intrinsic electrophysiology, also on the fact that their projections uh, are uh, similar, uh, we think that these really uh, correspond to a, a cell type. Um, a number of laboratories have, have shown over the years that there are really two, uh, in, in layer five, two main subtypes of uh, pyramidal neurons. There are these uh, so-called thick tufted layer five neurons, which are the ones I just described, that have a thick apical dendrite and a tuft in layer one and have non-adapting firing. And then there are thin dendrite neurons that have a thinner apical dendrite and don't have a tuft in layer one. And these show this property of adaptation. In addition, uh, we know from uh, work in collaboration with Sue McConnell uh, and uh, others as well that uh, a single transcription factor, um, FESF2, is responsible for the fate decision to adopt this fate of becoming a thick tufted neuron. In knockout animals that lack FESF2, there is a lack of the uh, 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 corticospinal projection, which is made by these neurons. And in fact, um, our contribution was to show that in addition, the morphologies of these neurons now resemble the thin dendrite type. And in addition, their, their uh, uh, electrophysiology, which is um, of this sort of bimodal two types in the wild type animals, either adapting or non-adapting, is now all, uh, all adapting. So again, by sort of uh, expression of this transcription factor, we really view this as a, as a major cell type. Okay, so that's an example for the pyramidal neurons. What about for the inhibitory interneurons? This is sort of um, a, a line that labels one of the quintessential inhibitory neurons, the so-called fast spiking basket cell. Uh, thank you. It's, it's called a, uh, it's referred to as fast spiking because uh, its action potentials are um, extremely rapid. What do I? Middle button. Ah, oh, there we are. Okay, great. Um, so it can fire up to hundreds of hertz. It has very specialized potassium currents that repolarize the individual action potentials very rapidly to prevent inactivation of sodium currents that then allow this to fire very rapidly. It, they're called basket cells because their somas, their their axons actually wrap around the somas and, and form basket-like structures, and so they're very powerful sources of, of inhibition in the cortex. And they're labeled in this line uh, called G42. Uh, my collaborator Josh Huang uh, at Cold Spring Harbor made this line, took uh, a huge chunk of the GAD1 gene. This is the synthesis enzyme that actually makes GABA, or one of two of them, and put that in a bacterial artificial chromosome and then made a transgenic animal that had this construct. But rather than recapitulating as some uh, back transgenes do, the full expression pattern of GAD1, it picked out only very small subsets of GABAergic neurons throughout the brain, and in particular in the cortex, it, it labels these parvalbumin-positive fast-spiking basket cells. So um, I'm going to return to this point, but I want to make the point that at least in uh, mammals, it appears that these positional effects where a transgene uh, inserts in the genome can have profound effects on where the transgene is expressed. So rather than, as I mentioned, uh, although the Thi1 promoter is active in many, many cells, in YFPH, it's only 
labels these uh, pyramidal neurons and the various other uh, subtypes of cells. Similarly, for the G42 neurons, we know from other examples where people have used the GAD promoter to drive, for example, GFP, they label other subtypes, in this case, three different subtypes of somatostatin positive neurons. And so the way that we think about this, although it's really not understood, is that especially in uh, the forebrain, that there is profound interactions between regulatory elements that are present just uh, upstream of the start of transcription in the, pro in the classical promoter. But it's not just that, it's also interactions with quite distal elements referred to as enhancers or repressors, I'll just call them enhancers, that uh, presumably loop in and regulate this uh, transcription. And so simply plunking down this promoter somewhere else in the genome is going to interact with a different set of enhancers and label different cell types. And I'm going to come back to uh, this as a, as a method for sort of discovering other cell types. So the basic approach then is to take a transgenic mouse in which fluorescent protein is expressed in some population of neurons that we've characterized anatomically and physiologically, micro dissect out a uh, section of a brain slice, in this case primary somatosensory cortex, dissociate the neurons like we might do for making neuronal cultures, but these are adult neurons, they wouldn't survive in culture, and then uh, manually sort out the fluorescent neurons, and uh, then lyse the cells, get the uh, messenger RNA, uh, amplify it, and uh, probe expression with sequencing or microarrays. Now, um, one of the reasons that this works is, as I mentioned, that the amplification is highly efficient. And so it turns out that, yes, if you start with only one or two or five or ten cells, then uh, you see a smaller number of transcripts present on the chip. And the reason is that presumably the rarer transcripts are not present in enough abundance that they amplify so that you can see them on the chip. However, if you start with 30 or 40 cells or more, we've gone out to 500, you don't see ever increasing numbers of transcripts. So this saturates. So we think we're essentially seeing everything that's there, at least that's on the chip, by about uh, 40 or 50 cells. The other thing that you want to be very sure of is, of course, that you're not seeing things that aren't supposed to be there. And that turns out to be straightforward to do because, for example, we know lots of genes that are restricted, like OLIG1 and OLIG2 uh, to uh, glia, uh, myelin basic protein, um, uh, or to red blood cells, this is a hemoglobin. And so if you don't sort the cells at all, then you see reasonable amounts of these and other transcripts. It turns out that if you sort them, but you don't do a good job of washing them by transferring them from dish to dish a couple of times, then you see some of this. Uh, but if you carry out this procedure well, then you see very little contamination with things that shouldn't be there. Um, now, uh, I'm going to take a slight um, detour here and just actually talk about various methods that have been used for isolating cells. And it turns out that, that you can do this manual method that I've just described to you. You can do something called uh, immunopanning to deplete or enrich for a particular set of cells that you like. You can use fluorescence-activated cell sorting. You can use a uh, method called TRAP in which you express in a population of neurons a specific uh, tagged um, ribosomal uh, a protein and um, uh, then just pull down, affinity purify the uh, mRNAs of interest. Or you can use a laser capture microdissection, which, for example, for human tissue is essentially the only game in town because you can't, you can't get uh, transgenic humans that express fluorescent proteins in particular cell types. Yes? So your data Well, it, it really depends on, the question is, can you do this on single cells? Yes, what you can, what, well, well, no, um, yes, you can do it if you don't care about seeing everything that's there. If you care about just seeing the more abundant things, then you could do it on single neurons. And so it's on the list to, to do more of this on single neurons, yeah. So when you look for 50 odd cells, you be very, very sure that they are all the same. Right. So really there, the devil is in the details of how carefully we've done the anatomy and physiology 
beforehand to characterize those, those cells. That's an extremely important point. Yes? How quantitative is it? I mean, the amplification. Okay, I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you that. Um, so, um, if one of the nice things about microarray experiments, and particularly for students that are interested in computation, is that all of this data is publicly deposited. You can't publish a paper using these sorts of techniques or sequencing without depositing the data. So you can actually get that data back and you can ask all sorts of additional questions about it. So one of the things you can ask, because people at talks like this asked me, was does how you isolate the cells matter? For example, you might worry that when you isolate, dissociate these cells, you radically change transcription. You turn on all sorts of things that aren't normally there. So, you know, we should look at, look at that. So, um, first of all, I should say that all of these methods are relatively uh, reproducible. That is, from re replicate to replicate, they have correlation coefficients, you know, in the high 0.9s. Um, they differ in how much background you see. So, it makes sense that when you're using laser capture to sort of draw a little circle around a cell, that you're actually pulling out not just that cell, but some other material associated with it. And so if you measure contamination or background by expression of, of genes that are, that are known to be restricted to GABAergic neurons or astrocytes or oligodendrocytes in samples that are not supposed to be any of these types, then basically you see that some of these methods that either uh, immunopurify or uh, laser capture uh, have a significant amount of, of background, um, whereas these other methods that dissociate and then sort either uh, automatically or manually um, have, have less background. Um, we also looked at whether there was activation of, for example, genes that are known to be involved in cell death, genes that are known to be involved in uh, stress. And yes, there are um, uh, genes that range from very active to very low. Uh, in terms of expression level, but there's no systematic difference between um, method. And um, so it doesn't seem like uh, we're, we're turning things on, with the exception of this PAN method that actually involves a little bit of culturing and also is looking specifically, some of these samples are oligodendrocyte and uh, other glia, there seems to be a slight activation of immediate early genes. That's the other category that we looked at. Um, but basically, these differences are very, are very small. Okay, so that's a little technical aside. So the basic experiment here uh, in the sort of state of where this was a few years ago when we first uh, published on this was that we looked at a dozen different cell types from the mouse forebrain. Uh, most of them are, are from the telencephalon. There's one diencephalic cell type here of interneurons in the thalamus. Um, and we could look at, um, for example, homologous uh, thick tufted pyramidal neurons in two different cortical areas in primary somatosensory cortex and in cingulate cortex, or uh, similar neurons that were pyramidal neurons labeled in the same line in the amygdala or in the hippocampus, as well as a subset of different uh, interneurons. And uh, we could find for each of these uh, long lists of genes uh, that were upregulated, shown in white or yellow, in a particular cell type, say, the YFPH uh, strain amygdala neurons and not in other cell types, or that were uh, upregulated in groups of related neurons, for example, in all GABAergic neurons that we looked at, or all of the telencephalic GABAergic neurons. Um, and this turns out to be a good uh, group to look at more closely because a lot of these genes were known from prior studies. So um, these are uh, three different uh, in interneuron types. And uh, these are two pyramidal neuron types, and these are unsorted cells. And uh, you can see that the vesicular inhibitory amino acid transporter, the kinate receptor, uh, GAD1 and GAD2, the synthesis enzymes, as well as uh, other transporters and transcription factors that were known, like Aristolus and DLX1 and DLX6, that were known to be expressed in uh, pan interneuronally, are all present. And uh, so we think that this is actually quite a accurate representation of what these cells uh, are expressing. Everything that's supposed to be there, we see, and uh, things that are not supposed to be there, uh, we don't see. Um, this is a more uh, recent example um, that's uh, largely unpublished. 
uh, in which we used a line that expresses uh, in locus ceruleus neurons. These are the primary source of noradrenergic modulation of the cortex and the rest of the forebrain. Um, and they're labeled in a line in which a tyrosine hydroxylase promoter drives uh, GFP. And here too, we could find a long list of things, some of which shown in green were known, like tyrosine hydroxylase itself. Uh, this is a transcription factor. This is a, uh, a transporter. This is dopamine beta hydroxylase, because these are neurogenergic neurons, et cetera. And then many things that were not known. Um, and one of the nice things about having access to the Allen Brain Atlas is we could not have to do all of the in situs ourselves to go verify this, but all the ones with the star, we could just look up and see that, in fact, there were uh, nice examples of labeling in the locus ceruleus, um, which is all sort of collected into a nucleus under the, near the cerebellum, and um, uh, confirm that, in fact, those things were, were expressed by in situ. So um, the original motivation for this was to have a sort of unbiased method for classifying cells, and indeed, it seems to work well for that. So first of all, uh, things are reproducible, so all of the uh, circles of the same color uh, wind up quite close to each other in this unsupervised clustering. Um, and uh, similarly, um, as one might expect, all of the glutamatergic neurons wind up close to each other uh, and separated from the GABAergic neurons. There also seems to be a huge difference between the GABAergic neurons in the telencephalon and those in the diencephalon. We haven't sampled quite densely enough yet to know whether uh, transmitter phenotype or major brain division is more primary. Um, you could see that things in neocortex uh, wound up very cl close to each other and closer than, for example, uh, other things in the limbic forebrain like amygdala and, and yeah. How many genes is this based on? Is it essentially the whole genome or is it the same big genes? No, this is essentially the whole genome. We actually what we did is just take all the genes that are differentially expressed across all the samples, uh, but that's like 2,000 genes or something like that. Um, but you get almost exactly the same clustering if you even include all genes. Um, this is a larger data set now um, that where we include some, uh, for example, experiments on um, developing um, interneurons and on uh, catecholaminergic neurons, which wind up, again, widely separated. So we think that this approach would likely scale for as we uh, do a larger number of, of cell types, which is something that we're doing in collaboration with Genelia Farm. So um, I want to, uh, as, as a way of introducing some of the things that we've used this for, actually um, raise some of the caveats to this approach for, for classifying neurons. And the, these should all be things that are kind of obvious to, to biologists or to uh, anyone that thinks about them for some time, but, but they're important to sort of think about how to address. The first is development. So, um, you know, expression changes dramatically, uh, not just early in development to the uh, mid, uh, you know, young adulthood that many of us study in slice experiments, but even it continues to, to evolve. Um, and we've looked at this in detail for in the case of these fast spiking basket cells. So here are the baskets that are formed around the somas of a pyramid. And you can see how distinctive their electrophysiology here is by this uh, FI curve that plots the firing rate as a function of injected current for a bunch of different uh, interneuron subtypes. And here's the fast spiking cells. You can see they get up to incredible rates of firing relative to the other interneuron subtypes. It also takes a lot to get them going. They have very low input resistance. Um, and of course, this does not, um, is not the case when the animal is younger. It's something that emerges over development. And so if you record from you can first identify these cells as having arrived in the cortex, they actually migrate in from the presumptive uh, striatum. Um, at, at about a week of age, they are able to sustain uh, firing, but at much lower rates and um, they have a much higher input resistance. And this then progressively drops over time the amount of uh, uh, current and voltage that it takes to get them to fire. Uh, uh, the amount of current that it takes them to fire increases quite a bit, and uh, their maximal firing rate increases. And so we, we asked ourselves, could we actually relate 
these changes in electrophysiological properties to the changes in gene expression over, these, over this period. And the changes in gene expression are enormous. So something like 2,000 genes change their uh, expression over uh, a particular uh, choice of, of <coughs> significance. Um, and most of these things are, are either monotonically increasing or decreasing. And so that's expressed here as just doing a, a principal component analysis of um, you know, the relative to these uh, ages that we've looked at. And you can see that most things either have a large um, uh, positive or negative principal component one. That is, they're, they're either decreasing with age uh, or increasing with age, and very few things have a, a low principal component one and a high uh, principal component two, which sort of measures how peaky the, uh, the expression is. So perhaps if we'd recorded, if we'd done this earlier in development, we might have seen many genes that turn on very transiently and then turn off, but we didn't see that from this period of phenotypic development. Yeah? Did, where, where, where is this spectrum? Is this just all neocortex, or is this a um, This is um, somatosensory uh, cortex. Um, we have, I'll get to that in a minute. For the interneurons, there's very little difference actually in gene expression or, or in properties. So not too surprisingly perhaps, given these electrophysiological changes, one of the biggest categories of things that were changing, both upregulating and downregulating, were uh, ion channel genes. Some of these were things that were known before, like um, KCNC1 and C2, uh, or KV3.1 and 3.2 is what the proteins are referred to, are these very rapidly activating potassium conductances that are known to be critical for the fast spiking. If you knock these out, they can't fast spike anymore. Um, and they're very specialized for these cells. Um, what was not known was uh, that they also upregulate these uh, leak channels. Uh, TASC1 and TWIC1 are the uh, uh, names of the, of the proteins, KCNK1 and K3 um, are the uh, gene names. And uh, we hypothesized that perhaps actually it was this that was contributing to the progressive drop in input resistance of these cells, the fact that it took more and more current to make them fire. And in fact, we could show at the protein level, uh, at least for task one for which there was a good antibody, that that also increased over this period. Uh, and then there aren't, it turns out, good drugs for um, uh, task one, but there's a, a somewhat uh, dirty uh, drug, bupivacaine, um, which blocks this leak current. And we could show that the proportion of the total leak that was blocked, that was bupivacaine sensitive, also increased. And then about the same time, Bernardo Rudy's lab um, found the same thing, and they went one step further and actually knocked out uh, task one and showed that, that, in fact, that had a dramatic impact on input resistance. So um, the, the uh, second sort of caveat to classifying cells by uh, their expression profile is that the same cell type in different regions of the cortex, to get to your uh, question, Peter, um, actually can, can have somewhat different properties. And um, I'll, I'll uh, give you one particular example of that. Um, but ultimately, what we would like and, and what people at the Allen Institute would like is to be able to recognize the same cell types across species and across <laughs> regions. And we've heard a lot about this, you know, sort of anatomical complexity. I'm not going to talk at all about how conserved things are across uh, species, um, but I do want to uh, address a little bit um, how, uh, how conserved things are across areas. And so we saw some of that in our original data, that is that that looking at the, these pyramidal neurons, for example, from uh, primary somatosensory cortex or from uh, cingulate cortex, there was very little difference in the, in the most expressed genes. If you go way down the list, you could find some very subtle differences. Um, actually, for this G30 interneurons, um, you, you couldn't really find any at the level of stringency that we were typically using, difference between the um, uh, neurons in these two different regions of cortex. Um, but uh, subsequently and somewhat fortuitously, we found um, a very dramatic difference in uh, the electrophysiological properties of one of these cell types as a function of uh, region. And that is these thick tufted pyramidal neurons that I told you 
were essentially non-adapting, that is, that there was a constant interval between their action potentials. Um, it, that turns out is true everywhere in the cortex except in motor cortex. And in motor cortex, they actually accelerate their firing with time. And this acceleration turns out to be due to the expression of this depolarizing ramp, which in turn we could show is due to uh, a slowly inactivating potassium conductance. And um, I, I won't go through all the gory details of which specific uh, subunits, but these are basically shaker subunits that contribute to uh, this slowly inactivating uh, so-called D current, uh, which you can block with very selective uh, toxins and uh, uh, which basically convert the firing type of these motor cortex neurons into those of the other uh, neurons. So did, do they express different subunits? Um, the answer is yes at the protein level. So it turns out that um, neuromabs have made beautiful antibodies to these different shaker subunits and we can show uh, that the somatic and proximal dendrites express different levels of one, two, three, and five, uh, which agreed with the toxin data that I'm not showing you. Um, uh, but if you look at the mRNA level, um, there was no significant difference between the corresponding uh, subunits. So whatever is causing this, and we don't fully understand the regulation, is, is happening at the, um, whoops, is happening at the uh, protein level and not at the, there it is, um, at the mRNA level. And so that's really just by way of caveat to remind you that there's a whole lot of biology that happens after uh, gene expression uh, and that that could also be cell type specific. There may be cell type specific differences in translation, in post-translational modifications, in trafficking, et cetera, and these approaches won't, won't address that. So what can you do with this? What, what can you uh, use this set of tools for? Um, we, as I mentioned, we were motivated initially for sort of understanding circuits and, uh, and classifying the cells that comprise them. I, I think I showed you one example where we could start to get at some of the uh, molecular causes, at least for ion channels, of cellular phenotypes, and we're doing a lot more of this. But I want to also go through an example where we've used this as a more sensitive assay for uh, changes in expression that might underlie disease states or uh, forms of plasticity. These are much more subtle um, differences in, in expression. And the, the particular example that I'll uh, describe is um, the uh, mouse model of Rett syndrome. So um, some of you may be familiar with this. It, the the uh, underlying protein MECP2 was discovered by Adrian Bird, who's here. And uh, Huda Jagbi then discovered that uh, mutations in this protein, MECP2, uh, cause most cases of this uh, genetic uh, monogenic form of uh, autism spectrum disorder. Although there are important differences phenotypically between Rett syndrome and uh, sort of mo most other forms of autism, uh, it's, it, it shares with it um, a, a tremendous impairment of, of language and of other cognitive functions. It's particularly devastating for the families that are affected because the parents initially think that they have a perfectly normal girl. I'll explain why I said girl in a, in a moment. And uh, they, what they then uh, see is after an initial year, year and a half of normal development, these girls begin to regress, they lose uh, l what language they've acquired, they lose purposive movements of their hands and uh, are often confined to a wheelchair and have a bunch of other uh, problems as well. Um, so this gene, MECP2, is, is X-linked and so uh, although this syndrome does happen in boys, um, in boys who only have a uh, one copy of MECP2, if, they, if that's a mutant copy, they typically have a very rapid course and often this doesn't get recognized as Rett syndrome, which is, occurs about one in 10,000, one in 15,000 uh, female uh, births. Um, neuropathologically, uh, the disorder is rather subtle. It's not a neurodegenerative disease. It's not that there is a loss of a particular cell type. Um, much more subtly than is indicated in this uh, uh, cartoon from a review by Huda Jagbi, there are some simplification of the dendritic trees 
uh, a reduction in the number of spines, a smaller soma size of uh, RET neurons, and therefore the whole brain is actually uh, reduced in size. And so we've been working on uh, sort of two ends of this problem. One, trying to use electrophysiology to actually understand what's altered in the cortical circuit, and two, use the sort of gene expression approaches to see what genes are misregulated. And uh, so w we found initially that uh, if you record from neurons in somatosensory or motor cortex under conditions in which there's spontaneous activity, and those are conditions where you actually reduce the uh, concentration of, of calcium and magnesium ions and increase the concentration of potassium, um, then uh, there's much less activity in the slices from the mutant animals. These are recordings from uh, layer five neurons. And um, we could see that even before the animals become uh, symptomatic. So there, there are really sort of um, three general ways in which you could imagine making neurons in a recurrent excitatory inhibitory circuit less um, uh, active. And what are those? Just to see if you're awake. Any of the students want to venture a guess? What, what could you change if you, if you had a model cortical circuit and now you want to make it less active? Change potassium. Change potassium? Okay. Well, you could change the intrinsic properties of the neurons themselves, right? So we could test that. We block all the synaptic transmission and record from the cells, and they're actually exactly <laughs> the same. So it's not that. What else could you change about this circuit? Well, this is a recurrent circuit, right? There are excitatory synapses, there are inhibitory synapses. So I could either make less excitation or I could make more inhibition. And it turns out that both of those are true. So if you record spontaneous synaptic input to these neurons, then there's a modest increase in the total integrated inhibitory charge, which we haven't really pursued much. And then there's a much more substantial reduction in spontaneous excitatory uh, currents. And it turns out um, that this change in the balance between excitation and inhibition may in fact contribute to the, to the uh, fact that it's much more dis difficult to induce long-term plasticity in slices from these animals, and presumably, therefore, to the fact that these animals have a harder time learning. But there's somewhat of a chicken and an egg problem here, because is it really the fact that the MECP2 has somehow targeted genes involved in LTP, and you've blocked LTP, and therefore synapses, excitatory synapses are weaker? Or is it that excitatory synapses are weaker and inhibitory synapses are stronger, therefore it's harder to induce LTP. So the way to get at this is to actually try to just isolate a pair of neurons and the synaptic connection between them and then ask whether you can still induce uh, normal LTP. And so um, using either a spike timing type uh, paradigm uh, that's illustrated here uh, or a pairing paradigm where you basically just depolarize the cell uh, and, and activate the presynaptic <coughs> cell. Um, uh, Varda and Danny was able to show that actually you can induce perfectly normal long-term potentiation at these synapses. So it seems like whatever MECP2 is doing, it's not disrupting the ability of the synapses to undergo LTP. And in fact, instead, what uh, Varda showed was that um, as the uh, disease becomes symptomatic, the amplitude of unitary synaptic connections between pyramidal neurons or the probability of finding any two cells that are connected both go down significantly. So basically you're, you're losing recurrent synapses between um, excitatory neurons. Now, um, what, how, how does this come about from loss of MECP2? Well, I have to tell you something more about what MECP2 does. Well, the way Adrian Bird discovered it was he was actually looking for proteins that bound to methylated DNA. So I've just finished telling you that cell types express different genes. One of the reasons that they do is because of DNA methylation. This is presumed and not entirely known, but, but the thought, the classic thought is that genes that are going to be shut off in a particular cell type, their promoters or various other parts get methylated. That then recruits MECP2 and other methyl DNA binding proteins that then re 
recruit repressor complexes that lead to uh, transcriptional silencing. Uh, as I mentioned, there, th this is somewhat a debated point, and there's some suggestion that actually binding of MUCP2 to some methylated DNA could actually activate it, but that's, um, I'll leave that alone. Anyway, the reason that we got into this in the first place is that when um, Rudy Yenish's lab and, and others first made the mouse knockouts and knocked out uh, MECP2, these animals got sick and died and they recapitulated many of the features of the human disease, but yet when they ground up the cortex or the cerebellum or whatever, they found really subtle changes in gene expression. So if there was a 7% you know, difference in this gene or a 5% difference in this gene, they could, if you looked across a 10 gene classifier, you could say this was mutant and this was wild type, but no single gene was significant. Um, and so that, of course, led us to think, well, maybe it's because you're grinding up uh, different cell types in which different genes are affected by loss of MECB2. And this sort of take home message uh, is, is that that's the case. So this is what we refer to as the dilution problem. And that is if you imagine that you have a big change, a tenfold change in one cell type as a result of some manipulation, plasticity, disease state, whatever, but that cell type only comprises 1% of the total tissue, and now you assay it in the whole tissue, you, you're obviously going to see a much smaller change, a barely significant change. And so we reasoned if we could actually pull out individual cell types in the MECP2 background, we could test this idea. And so we did it for four different cell types that were chosen to be as different as possible. These thick tufted pyramidal neurons, fast spiking basket cells in the cortex, and then these locus ceruleus catecholaminergic neurons and uh, Purkinje neurons in the cerebellum that also are labeled in this G42 line. Um, and the first thing we saw is that there were actually large uh, differences. So, you know, 10, 50 fold uh, changes in expression. Um, and uh, this just shows for three of the, of the cell types. Um, these are not as big as the, difference, as the baseline differences between gene expression between cell types, but they're still large relative to what was seen in tissue. Um, Are not what? Oh, well, no. I mean, collagen, it turns out, no, most genes are not expressed uniquely in the nervous system. They most have function. So collagen is important in our connective tissue. It's also important in uh, fast spiking basket cells and, and uh, you know, the extracellular matrix that gets constrained and so on. So, uh, and that's, that's true. Some of these are um, uh, things, you know, uh, genes that were really isolated first in the, in the uh, nervous system. This is a presynaptic protein, et cetera. So, but that's an important point. Um, so this is, this is a representation of all of the genes that were affected uh, in the knockout. Um, first of all, we saw more things that were um, upregulated than uh, downregulated, as you might expect if you were mostly, uh, if, if this were mostly a repressor. Um, and you could also see that it's really the minority of genes that are altered uh, in multiple cell types. For most things, they're altered in one cell type, but not in the others. And so it makes sense that if you grind everything up together, you're actually going to see uh, a reduced um, uh, a signal in the tissue. Um, now, I should say that although it was largely different genes that were affected in these different cell types, there was one category of, of genes, namely cell adhesion molecules, that was affected in all of the four, only three of which are shown here, um, uh, cell types that we looked at. And um, so this is, this is intriguing, obviously. Uh, many of these uh, fell in families that have well-described roles, both in the nervous system and outside of the nervous system. Cadherins do a lot else outside of the neuro nervous system. Collagens, protocadherins, uh, contactins, et cetera. Um, and so um, this is, a, is another sort of representation of this that asks the question of how likely would this uh, occur by chance? And, and essentially, what the color here indicates the, uh, how many cell types we, we saw the uh, change in and um, what this is a representation of the whole uh, gene ontology um, set of categories which are hierarchically organized, which were 
uh, altered. And so you, basically you can see that this is huge relative to uh, these other categories. Um, and this is actually a statistical test by Monte Carlo simulation of how often you would expect this uh, by chance. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the probability that you get for the, for the result. So we think that this is real. Um, is, it, is it causal? I mean, uh, that is really the big problem here. So the hypothesis is that loss of MECP2 leads to a, a cell-specific defect in cell adhesion molecule <coughs> expression, and that then has diverse effects in different circuits in the cortex that causes a loss of recurrent excitatory synapses uh, that kind of shuts down activity. Um, but really to, to get at this, what we need to be able to do is manipulate uh, these uh, cell adhesion molecules in specific cell types in the way that um, is, is uh, evident in the disease state. And this is true more generally. I mean, in order to figure out the mapping between expression and neural function, you've got to not just measure it, you've got to be able to manipulate it. And so what I want to leave you with in the last uh, few minutes is uh, are some recent efforts to uh, sort of build some better tools for how you would how you would do this in the nervous system. This is something that, that many people are interested in. We've heard about some efforts from the Allen uh, Institute to develop transgenic lines. The basic strategy that's, that's used is a combinational uh, one. That is uh, a combination of two different alleles. A driver allele that expresses a molecule like the Cree recombinase that can recognize sites that you put into the DNA and knock out a gene. Or uh, a transcriptional activator like uh, the TET transcriptional activator. Uh, and then this, the driver allows this recombinase or transcriptional activator to only be expressed in a certain subset of cells. And then you have a responder allele, which is your particular gene of interest, that either has the LOXP sites that are recognized by Cree or has the uh, TET response element that's recognized by TET. And the point of doing this separately is that now you can examine many genes in a particular cell type or examine many cell types in, their, in the importance of a particular uh, gene. So, um, oops, the um, sort of standard approach uh, for doing this is to knock in um, uh, Cree recombinase or an inducible form of Cree recombinase uh, that can be activated by giving tamoxifen um, into a locus that you know is active in a particular uh, cell type. And so together with Josh Wang, um, we've characterized a bunch of lines that, that he's made that al allow us to target interneurons. Um, and and these are, are widely available from JAX and other places. The, the problem with this approach is that it's just not specific enough. So um, although in general we like the idea that you know one, one gene identifies one cell type, the reality is that actually any given cell type is really represents the conjunction of multiple genes and any given gene is active in multiple cell types. And I'll just give you a brief example of the pitfalls that come from this problem. So, we were interested in the issue of how do these fast spiking cells remember who they are? What aspects of their biology tell them to keep making the same proteins and keep having the same neuronal identity? And so um, it turns out that in addition to uh, gene expression, there's regulation of translation through microRNAs as we heard. How important are these microRNAs in keeping their neuronal identity. And so the way to look at this is to knock out a key bottleneck in the production of microRNAs, the enzyme dicer. And so conveniently there is a, an allele, a flox dicer, and we have an animal that expresses Cree recombinase just in these uh, parvalbumin positive neurons, which in the cortex are these fast spiking basket cells and axoaxonic cells, but there's lots of other parvalbumin expressing neurons across the brain. And so the question is, is there some effect on these neurons of knocking out dicer? Um, and uh, initially, uh, we were extremely excited to see a very powerful effect uh, of, of knocking out dicer on the behavior of mice. So this is, if you knock out dicer everywhere, it's lethal. That animal was normal, it was a heterozygote. This animal just lacks dicer and parvalbumin positive neurons. And you can see that it has some major motor deficits. And I'll, I'll spare you the actual um, physiology, 
but uh, essentially it was all uh, negative. And, uh, oops, look at that again. So essentially the fast spiking neurons in the cortex are totally normal um, in these mice and uh, uh, presumably this is a problem in parvalumin positive neurons in the spinal cord or uh, somewhere else. So that, that sort of serves as motivation for an alternative strategy um, which is uh, referred to as an enhancer trap strategy. The idea is that you insert uh, a weak promoter that by itself is not really able to drive transcription and you randomly insert it throughout uh, the genome into different locations and uh, it lands next to different enhancers that can then enhance transcription from this promoter. So if you're familiar with GAL4 lines uh, in flies, that's the basic strategy. This is, this is a, a strategy in mice um, that, that uh, was done in collaboration with Carlos Lois and basically uses lentiviral transgenesis to insert uh, a, a, this weak heat shock promoter uh, driving a, a reporter and driving, as we'll see, TET um, in ran random places in the genome. And we then just screen mice and see if they have interesting patterns of expression um, in the brain. I won't go through the sort of uh, strategy. So here's one example. This is a strain of mice uh, in which the neurons that are labeled are Cajal Retzi cells. These are excitatory neurons that sort of pioneer the cortex. And here they are, they uh, still around in the dentate gyrus. Um, if you look earlier, you can see them in the neocortex as well. This is another line that labels a, a specific population of thalamic relay neurons. This line labels one of two main subtypes of pyramidal neurons in piriform cortex, so-called semilunar uh, cells. Um, and um, uh, a variety of these label um, uh, neuronal subtypes in the neocortex. This labels just uh, most of the uh, neurons in the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. So it turns out that there are many um, genes that are expressed throughout the entire thalamus. There is no gene that is restricted to the LGN that just lights up the LGN. So this is giving you a sense that this is a more potentially selective uh, labeling. What you can see is the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus and then the uh, axons in layer four and layer six and layer one of primary visual cortex. Um, here's a couple of other examples. This uh, driver line labels uh, layer four neurons in primary sensory areas. Um, this labels a subset of layer five neurons just in prefrontal cortex. These seem to be cells that project to the raphinucleus and other modulatory uh, nuclei. Um, this labels a subset of layer six neurons. It turns out that these are corticothalamic neurons. You can see some labeling in the thalamus here. But it turns out that there are actually two subtypes of corticothalamic neurons. There's some that project back from a sensory area to the primary nucleus. So in somatosensory cortex, it's the um, uh, v VPM in the lateral geniculate nucleus for the uh, visual cortex uh, shown here. And you see these don't project to the lateral geniculate nucleus. They project outside of it to uh, PO in the case of the uh, somatosensory system or the pulvinar equivalent in the uh, case of the visual system. So uh, the point is not the sort of fine details of these particular connections, but just that this is a potential strategy for picking out a very, very selective subsets of cell types. Um, and so it's something that we're actively pursuing. This is um, the sort of summary of where we were a couple of months ago screened about 150 different uh, lines and uh, roughly a third of them to a quarter of them have interesting expression patterns. So I think these are really interesting times for uh, vertebrate for mammalian neuroscience because some of the kinds of tricks that have long been available uh, for my colleagues that work on invertebrate nervous systems are now starting to really mature and be feasible um, in the mouse. And uh, you know, I want to just leave this group with the idea that in addition, there's a tremendous uh, sort of computational problem of how you constrain expression in these particular cell types. What actually makes a cell type? How is it that they know to express some genes and not others? Uh, in addition to the computational issues that we've known about for a long time about how do you actually build neural circuits that do things? And I'll stop there after thanking some of the people that have done the work. Um, much of this work was started in my lab by Ken Seguino and Chris Hempel uh, with 
help on the physiology from these individuals. Mouse making uh, in my lab has been uh, largely the efforts of Yasushima in collaboration with Josh Meyer and Carlos Lois. And uh, I talked about the uh, projects in the Rett's mouse that was in collaboration with these individuals. Thanks very much. I mean, it's, it's sort of the boring answer, but I think that both are true. It really depends on the gene. So in the case of uh, Fragile X and MECP2, um, like Dicer, we're talking about a very fundamental, very common piece of biology that's going to do lots of things in lots of different cells. Um, but uh, clearly, there are channelopathies where it's a single, you know, mutation in a, in a sodium channel or a potassium channel that gives you a very well-defined disease. I think in general, um, the, the classical molecular biological one gene, one function approach is going to be a very rare case. And the very fuzzy systems biology, it's all a network, is going to be, unfortunately, the, the reality for most of it, for most phenotypes. Um, so, you know, I think it really is a complex mapping from every level to the next level and um, that's, you know, that we're going to need to get in those weeds to, to figure it out. Yeah? So I'm wondering if, if you or anybody is, is mining these data to look for kind of second order statistics and that the reason is, as you probably know from the, from the harder is that in the somatic acid gang and we're finding that while individual mRNA copy numbers for different eye channels can vary all over the place, specific cell types have like fixed ratios for pairs or even quadruplets of eye channel types. Yeah. And so, so you, that you wouldn't see by looking at individual expression numbers of just by, only by the pair or the Right. So, um, it, it's important to note um, two very important differences between this sort of experiment and the experiment that you're referring to. One is that we're always looking at at least 30 or 40 neurons. So we're averaging out those cell to cell differences. And it's very much on the books to ask whether we see similar things. Um, and there's plenty of transcripts that are abundant enough that you could do that for, even ion channels. Um, the other thing is that we're looking at genetically identical animals that have been raised very similarly, as opposed to crabs or lobsters that are very divergent from one another genetically and have had very different experience crawling across the ocean floor for years before the fishermen grab them and give, sell them to Eve or you. Um, so I, don't, I, I suspect we're not going to see that level of variability. There might be some, and it, and it, it might be quite interesting. Um, but it's, it's, an, it's an interesting question. How much of that variability that you see, that Eve sees, is experience dependent versus how much of it is, is genetic? Certainly, there are big strain differences. We heard about an allusion to that um, earlier. Uh, there can be very significant strain differences uh, in some genes. Um, so it'd be, it'd be interesting to, to mine that. Yeah. So, classification question. Um, from a single cell, you can pull out a relatively small number of, of these of, uh, genes. 
how accurately can we classify it based on that small number? Right. So we, I should say we haven't tried to do that. Um, and it depends on what method you, so first of all, I should say that the microarray method and the sequencing method are highly quantitative. The method that most people use for analyzing single cells, RT-PCR, um, is not highly quantitative. It's very difficult to quantify that well. Um, so if one wants to do lots of single cell microarrays or single cell sequencing, maybe you could address this. Um, the second important point is it totally depends on who your outgroup is. So what I mean by this is, let me give you an example. Um, everywhere besides somatosensory cortex in the cortex, if you express parvalbumin, you are a fast spiking neuron. However, there are many other cells in the whole brain that express parvalbumin. If you allow all of those cells to be an outgroup, then having parvalbumin doesn't tell me that much. But if you, you tell me, oh, I'm in the cortex and I'm not in somatosensory cortex, and I say not in somatosensory cortex because strangely there, layer five pyramidal neurons can express some low level of parvalbumin. But anyway, it, it totally depends on who you're comparing to, how many genes you need, and we haven't tried to actually calculate that, but it is an interesting issue. Yes, no. no, no, it's it's levels of expression. That's what I'm saying. We could see over, you know, I don't know, 10 log 2 units, something like that, differences in expression, maybe even more. And does the reliability drop if you only use, I mean, often very highly expressed genes are less interesting and more interesting genes are expressed at lower levels. Do you lose reliability for genes? Well, I mean, there, there are interest, interest and, and, and uh, usefulness for classifying are actually can be found at all expression levels. So, for example, CAMK2 is present in all excitatory neurons and not all inhibitory neurons. So that gives you a pretty important binary distinction, but it's a very pretty abundant protein. Um, but yes, I mean, uh, it's, it's much harder to classified just on um, rare um, markers, you know, on, on poorly expressed markers. Okay, thank you very much.